Yeah, this is my dad, and he, he was stuck down the block in his car, down here. He's coming over to my house now. That's my house next door that snapped off. And you're going to see the boat come out. With my dad on it. See the helicopter? We were rescued before him from those stairs, that white fence. That's my house. Here's my dad. He's going to get off the boat. He was actually coming in his car to try to save us, but flooded it. And he had a breakout, and a guy on the corner threw him a rope and saved him off the hood of his car. That's my dad right there. And the whole time we were home in the house, didn't know if he was made it or not. He lived next door, but he was um, left to bring his wife to his sister's and was on his way back home. And the water was up to my bay window. The full extent of the ruin caused by Sandy is only now coming into focus. So let's go to ABC's Dan Harris, our colleague, who is in Staten Island tonight. Dan? Terry, good evening to you from in front of what remains of a neighborhood restaurant here. The people in this area say they were hit by a sort of tsunami. In many ways, it was a secret tsunami because the vast majority of the media attention has really focused on the Jersey Shore and also lower Manhattan. So today, we decided to travel here to Staten Island to see for ourselves this hidden pocket of utter devastation. We woke up this morning to alarming images out of Staten Island. People being plucked off their roofs two days after Sandy in scenes reminiscent of Katrina. Also reports of a desperate search for two children swept away from their mom in the storm surge. And then word that the death toll had nearly doubled to 14. It was becoming clear that Staten Island, a sleepy enclave best known as the namesake for the famous Staten Island Ferry, was a world away from the rest of this city, which today was getting moving again. So we hopped in the car outside of our office in Manhattan, expecting a journey that would be made very difficult by the city's maddening post-storm gridlock. Instead, the real problem became getting gas. We drove around northern New Jersey for hours, encountering interminable lines and frustrated people. It's activated. That storm did a thing. No power, did a thing. No, did a thing. Knocked out everything. We were only saved by some relatives of one of our colleagues who brought us a two-gallon jug of gas. Yes, yes you should. Okay, keep just it. keep it's it. okay. Finally, we arrived. And look at what we saw next from our window. The transformer blew up and just took the whole store down. That's my open sign. This is the store. It burned down completely. Then we got to the flood. My house, Mike the Roman had just salvaged oh, his kids' right clothing here. from their flooded my out dad, house. Yeah. Everything is floating. I saw my couch floating by. You saw your my couch house. floating by. Yeah. So, What's that like? Well, stuff you pay for, stuff you buy, stuff you work for. We quickly started to hear stories about a wall of water that came through here. The water was up to that bay. Up to the bay windows, yes. At one point, the water was up to the bay windows coming into our front door. And yes. dragging cars down the street. Dragging cars. I dragged my car out of the driveway down the street, flipping cars over. As you can see down the street here, there was cars okay. flipped over. And it was just it was just amazing. Was it was like a tsunami at one point. The waves, the pressure of the waves that were coming, they were over these houses here. And it was just extraordinary what was happening. It was coming in rushing like a, like a rapids. It was just coming. It was just curving around that corner. Far and from fucking down. extraordinary. Some people were trapped in their homes and drowned. There have been a lot of comparisons to Katrina, which is 
interesting for me, given that I covered Katrina. And I'll we tell you, this, this is something that really does remind me of Katrina. Come on, emergency. Okay.